Hi, I'm Infernum, and this is my recap for the anime The Strongest Magician in the Demon Lord's Army Was a Human. If you like my recaps, please subscribe. This is a story about the most powerful mage in the entire Demon King's army. His power is so great that he can single-handedly capture entire cities. However, this demon has one small secret. A girl opens a book that tells the story of a mage named Ike, who served in the Demon King's army. The fortress walls were under attack, and the demons charged forward to besiege the fortress. Ike, along with his servant, discussed that everything was going well because the demons were equipped with a battering ram, as Ike had commanded. The demons broke into the castle and mercilessly slaughtered the people one by one. The head of the knights watched all this from his castle. Suddenly, the door opened, and when he turned around, he saw Ike, who had come to the knight with a proposition. The knight had to choose, surrender, and hand over the city to Ike, take his own life here as a knight of honor, or simply run away while Ike cleared everything out. However, none of the options pleased the knight, and he decided to attack Ike. But Ike had foreseen this outcome and easily defeated the knight with his magic. Ike's servant entered behind him and said that the city was completely captured. Ike asked to take the knight and heal him as well as all the other people in the city who had already surrendered. A mysterious girl who was watching Ike was surprised by his honors as he managed to capture such a huge city without any problems in just one week. Ike decided to erect a barrier, and looking outside, he admitted that he felt guilty because so many people had suffered because of him. He took off his mask and revealed that the reason was that he was human, not a demon. Recalling the past, when the great sorcerer Romberg took him in the lands of the demons and taught him everything he knew, Ike remembered the day Romberg Romberg told him never to take off his mask and cloak. Romberg warned him that if the demons found out Ike wasn't a demon, the demon king would never forgive such a thing. Ike was confident there was no one else in the room and that no one could get in, as he had erected a barrier. However, a few seconds later, he noticed a maid hiding under the table who had seen everything. She began to worry that Ike would kill her, then hit her head and simply fell. Ike was upset that he had kept his secret for 20 years and had blown it just like that. Ike's servant knocked on the door, and as they walked around the city, his servant remarked that Ike had left too many people alive. Ike explained that this was a trading city, and without people, there would be no profit for the demons. Since the current demon king valued results over means, leaving the people alive would be highly beneficial for the demons. The servant bumped into Ike, and before them stood people who asked Ike how much they should pay in taxes. Ike responded that the amount would remain the same. The people smiled, but Ike warned that anyone who attempted a revolt in the city would be severely punished. Suddenly, Ike felt felt himself being teleported and vanished, leaving only dust behind. He found himself in a dark place, and a huge golem appeared behind him and immediately attacked. Ike immediately realized that it was the commander who had teleported him, as she had promised not to do so without warning, yet she always broke that promise. Ike defeated the golem effortlessly, and the commander admired his abilities, saying the boy had grown so strong. Sephira, the commander of the Seventh Corps of the Demon King's army, was Ike's direct superior and the most important of all demons as she was the only one who knew Ike's secret. She was glad to see him, and Ike thought she needed to hear news about the captured city. However, Sephira said she already knew everything. Ike then didn't understand why Sephira had summoned him. Sephira told him that the Demon King wanted to see Ike. Ike couldn't understand why him, specifically. Sephira replied that it was probably because Ike had captured the city in just one week. Sephira told Ike to place his hand on her shoulder. Ike did so, but Sephira was surprised that Ike didn't even try to touch her chest, and they teleported to together to the Demon King. The maid who had fainted woke up and tried to leave the room, but bumped into the barrier. Turning back, she saw food on the table with a note that told her not to go anywhere and just eat. She decided to try the food and was very surprised at how delicious it was. Ike and Sephira arrived at the Demon King's territory, and Ike felt unwell because of the Demon King's miasma surrounding the area. Being human, Ike felt uneasy. They continued, and Ike asked Sephira why all demons who go to the Demon King are checked for their appearance. However, Sephira told him not to worry, and that she would take care of everything. She used magic on Ike, and the demon's standing guard felt Ike's power, remarking that this was the grandson of the former strongest mage, Romberg. Sephira asked if he was taking so long, and they were allowed to pass further. As they walked down the huge long corridor, Ike asked Sephira how much longer it would take. Sephira replied that they were almost there, and asked if Ike felt bad that she could fly, and he couldn't. Ike responded,
responded that of course not, although deep down, he also wanted to fly. He could do it, but not as skillfully as Safira. They reached a room, and Safira said she would enter first, and then call Ike in. Ike thought about how the current Demon King was very powerful, and had completely changed the war against humans. He was ruthless and cold-blooded, but he valued his subordinates based on their abilities. By nature, demons don't like working together, but the Demon King had changed that. It was time for Ike to meet the Demon King. Safira called Ike and said he could enter. The Demon King asked Ike to lift his head. Ike did so, and was surprised to see that the Demon King was actually a Demon Queen. She praised Ike for capturing the city in just one week, to which Ike responded that he was simply following Safira's orders and that all the glory should go to her. However, the Demon Queen noticed this and said that Ike was behaving too humanely. Ike became frightened, thinking he was digging his own grave. Safira intervened and said that Ike was the grandson of the former strongest mage, who was once called the Protector of Hell. The Queen immediately understood the situation and realized why Ike hadn't slaughtered the population, but managed to keep the people and take the city with minimal losses. Ike started to worry as his actions were revealing his human nature. However, he decided to speak up and told the Queen that he spared the people because it would be more beneficial for the demons. He pointed out that in the past, cities cleansed of people were less productive than those where the population was left intact. Ike realized how smart and strong the Queen was. Suddenly, the Queen teleported to Ike and said that next time she wanted to see him without his mask because he was different from the demons, and then she left. Ike exhaled, understanding that the Queen knew he wore a mask. Safira smiled, seeing that even Ike was afraid of something, but she told Ike he was lucky that the Queen hadn't discovered he was not a demon. Ike returned to the city and noticed that the plate was empty, and on his chair lay the maid. He woke her, and she immediately understood the situation, kneeling and begging Ike not to kill her. Ike assured her that he wouldn't harm her and asked for her name. She replied that slaves were not given names, but her mother called her Trenny. Ike told her that he couldn't let her go because she knew his secret. She immediately threw herself at Ike, begging for her life. Ike told her that she would now serve him as a maid. Ike, along with his servant and demons, gathered in the city of Ivalice, which had been granted to him. Safira explained why Ivalice had been given to Ike. It was on the front line. Although the city was not large, it had crucial strategic importance for the army. Safira asked Ike to defend the city and double its revenues. Ike informed everyone that humans could attack the city at any moment and their first task was to restore the walls. His servant mentioned that gathering workers from the city and completing the work would take six months. Ike was disheartened because that was too long, so he declared that they would rebuild the walls in one month. The servant complained that it was impossible, but Ike insisted that both humans and demons would be working on the repairs. Observing this from afar, Ike saw humans and demons working together. He established three shifts and even paid everyone a salary to motivate them to work. The servant was amazed by Ike realizing that his reputation as a genius was well-earned. At one point, Ike noticed that the demons were struggling to move a massive boulder from the city. Approaching them, he asked them to step aside and then destroyed it with his magic. The servant decided he would serve Ike forever, convinced that Ike was a true genius. The demon horde is heading towards the fortress, but the strongest mages of humanity stand on its walls. They attempt to destroy the demons with fireballs, believing they have defeated them. Suddenly, the demons feel nothing and break through the fortress walls. The queen is informed that the demons are currently pushing back the people who are trying to escape to other cities for help. Realizing that people are clinging to her in their final moments, the queen decides to ask Ike to handle the situation. Meanwhile, Ike, accompanied by his maid who brings him tea, hints that he is tired after reconstructing the city. The head of the order, Alistia, is summoned to meet with someone who orders her to defend the city of Evilace which was granted to Ike. Alistia sets off for there. In the city, people in an alley are trying to make money with a find the ball in the cup game. Trinia tries to win, but she has no money. The scammer decides to kick her out because she has no money, but then he notices Trinia's chest and says he can take her in exchange. She lifted all the cups with magic, and everyone noticed that he was deceiving people. Ike found her and said that Trinia should stay close to him. Ike changed clothes and mentioned that they needed to learn about the people's plans, so they shouldn't stand out, and they continued on. Ike noticed the knights and realized that the rumors about the Alliance of Kings had turned out to be true. Recently, people had united to resist the demons. Throughout history, they had united three times, and each time pushed back the demons. Trinia started worrying, because if Ike were pushed back, she would be left alone, like those children they had caught. Ike noticed the children and gently patted Trinia on the head. 
Just as they were about to leave, a man who had deceived people earlier stopped them. He intended to get revenge on Trinia for exposing him, but Ike noticed they were alone and things could go badly. He froze the giant's legs and then fully froze him. Ike approached him and told him to answer his questions, but the man started to defy Ike. Ike pierced him with an icy spike and the man decided not to say anything unnecessary. Ike asked him why the knights had entered the city today. The man said he didn't know anything. Ike told him there was no point in keeping him alive then, but the man didn't want to die and revealed that the knights planned to strike the demons much earlier in Ivalice. Ike took the information and left. The man asked him to remove the ice, but Ike simply walked away. In his chamber, suddenly, Lilith burst in and began asking Ike where he had been and why he had been gone for so long. She noticed the person next to him and asked who she was. Trinia introduced herself and said she served Ike. Lilith started teasing her, questioning how such an ugly servant could serve Ike, hinting that she herself could serve Ike better. Trinia got angry and asserted that Ike chose her to be his servant. They began arguing. Later in the evening, a squad of knights tried to ambush the demons and attack them, but suddenly undead appeared unexpectedly, pushing the people back. The knights had to retreat. Ike's servant admitted that it was by Lord Ike's order that they managed to ambush the human squad. But suddenly, an arrow shot Ike from behind, and he fell to the ground. Later that evening, in the hall of the general who had sent Alistia to clear Ivalice, it was reported that demons had ambushed them. The general became furious and ordered Alistia to be imprisoned, fearing the king would not forgive him if he heard about this. Ike woke up in a bed next to his superior, who was sleeping beside him. She suddenly woke up and began teasing Ike again, even suggesting that while he was asleep, he had touched her chest. Ike and Safira got up, and Safira explained that Ike had been injured, and she had healed him. She also mentioned that Ike still hadn't killed anyone, hinting that the queen might notice something, and then she left. Ike began to ponder who might have tried to kill him with an ordinary arrow, when suddenly Trinia and Lilith entered his room. They started clinging to Ike and arguing with each other. However, Ike's servant appeared, expelled Lilith, and closed the door. Ike praised him and assigned him the task of finding out the location of the head of the order, Alistia. The next morning, his servant informed him that Alistia had been thrown into prison for failing to liberate the city of Ivalice. Ike went to the prison, with Lilith trailing behind him. Ike didn't ask her to come along. He merely requested her to behave quietly since she was there. Lilith stuck to Ike and followed him inside. As they approached, they noticed the prison wasn't heavily guarded. While Ike pondered how to handle things quietly, Lilith took action and cleared the way. Inside, Ike observed that the prison was too vast and they needed time to find Alistia. However, Lilith dealt with one of the guards and learned that Alia was on the upper level. Suddenly, pursuers appeared behind them. Lilith said she would handle them herself. Ike asked her to avoid unnecessary bloodshed, but looking back, he realized Lilith hadn't listened and moved on. Finding the room where Alistia was held, Ike opened the door and found it empty. As he entered, someone in a cloak attacked him from behind. It turned out to be Alistia, and Ike quickly subdued her. Alistia asked why he had come. Ike countered by asking if she had sent the assassin who had tried to kill him, as he needed to know who was responsible. Alistia understood and questioned if he was truly a demon. Just then, the guards discovered a demon had entered the prison, and they all rushed towards Alistia. Alistia grabbed her knife and decided to apprehend Ike, refusing to believe he was a demon and assuming he was human. In the prison where Alistia is held, everyone learned that a demon had infiltrated, trying to kidnap her. Everyone ran to the upper floors to reach her, while Alistia asked Ike whether he was a demon or a human. Ike decided to use magic to show her that he was indeed a demon, not a human. Alistia didn't understand what kind of magic Ike used. Ike said he had dulled the instincts of everyone around. He approached the knights and defeated them, but he didn't notice another knight sneaking up behind him who was supposed to injure Ike. However, Ike reacted in time and dodged. He used gravity magic, causing the guard to fall from a height but Ike stopped his descent and saved him. Alistia noticed this, and while she was processing what had happened, the floor beneath her collapsed and she fell down. Ike managed to save her, letting her down gently on the ground. He introduced himself as a demon and the commander of the squad. Alistia immediately realized he was the one who had easily blocked her attack recently. Ike asked her if she had sent the assassin meant to kill him, to which Alistia replied that she was a knight and wouldn't reveal anything to him, suggesting that Ike should just kill her. Ike approached her and used mind reading, but he couldn't discern anything. 
Alistia felt embarrassed, not understanding what Ike was doing. Suddenly, Lilith appeared from behind, growing jealous of Ike for trying to flirt with another girl. Ike finished his conversation and decided to leave. As he was leaving with Lilith, Alistia called out to him, asking if he was really going to leave just like that. Ike replied that everything was over, and he understood that Alistia was not at fault. He also gave Alistia some advice. In order for her to respect and love herself more, Ike said he was going home. Lilith suggested that maybe they could stay longer since they were alone and could do something for two, to which Ike simply left. Trinia met Ike, who brought her rice that he had picked up on the way, and he told her that the people in Ivalis grow wheat, but rice is much better and more efficient. With rice, the city can recover its economy much faster, and it's easier to grow, requiring less time. This way, the remaining time can be used by the workers for other tasks. Trinia began to get a headache from all this information, but Ike explained clearly that they would have food and more workers, which would improve the economy. He asked Trinia to prepare a meal with the rice. However, Trinia said she didn't even know how to cook it. Ike admitted that he didn't know either, but he had heard that rice needs to be boiled before it can be eaten. Trinia assured him she wouldn't let him down and would do it right, and Ike left to finish another task. Ike gathered all the warriors outside and decided to test them. He was pondering the fact that a warrior using arrows was attacking him, and a spy had definitely infiltrated Ike's group. Ike used mind reading and noticed one of the warriors realizing he had been exposed. Ike teleported to him and declared that he was the spy. Ike then went to Sephira, who was bathing in the springs at the time. Ike said he would talk to her once she was done and began to leave, but Sephira asked him if he had found a traitor among their warriors. Ike replied that it was the deputy commander of the 7th Corps, Jace. Ike noted that he was quite clever and asked what they should do with him. Sephira stood naked in front of Ike, causing him to blush, and she said he needed to be punished. The goblins, along with Jace, discussed the fact that they had been discovered as spies. Jace decided he needed to attack Ike urgently since they had been exposed. Suddenly, Jace was informed that Ike had come to him, and he was all alone. Jace approached Ike, who noticed that Jace had prepared for this confrontation. Ike asked him if he was ready to fight. Jace replied that these were his lands and he would do as he pleased. Jace began to question Ike, pretending that Ike was injured, but Ike said he hadn't noticed and realized that they had a traitor among them. Jace decided to punish Ike, claiming he had many more warriors than Ike and that everyone wanted to deal with him. Ike replied that these are all your warriors. Just then, a meteorite crashed into the city and everyone looked up to see Sephira wreaking havoc with her magic. As soon as Sephira finished casting her spells, the warriors entered the city and began to eliminate Jace's fighters. Ike teleported behind Jace and presented him with two options. He could surrender now or after losing everything. Jace ordered his men to attack Ike, but Ike easily defeated all the goblins. At the same time, Jace decided to hide and escape. However, a huge demon appeared in front of him, nearly capturing Jace. Jace managed to escape through a secret passage he had recently created. As Jace was leaving, he said that he would retreat today, but would return for Sephira. However, Ike caught up with him and declared that he wouldn't get away, as Ike's familiar was following him. Ike urged Jace to surrender, but Jace refused. Ike stated that Jace had grown much weaker and magically bound him to a tree with his vines. Jace gave up and said he was sorry and he was surrendering. He began to praise Ike and his talent, suggesting that he help clean up the demon army alongside Jace. He mentioned that the current demon ruler had forbidden killing humans, which Jace, like all the demons serving the demon lord, did not like. Jace asked if Ike would join them, but Ike refused. Jace decided to catch him off guard and threw a blade at him. However, Ike dodged and asked him that since he was speaking to them, it meant Jace wasn't acting alone. Suddenly, Sapphira appeared and started tormenting Jace. She said that Ike had been trying to gather information for too long and that she had no time to waste. Ike asked Sapphira to stop, watching as Jace was poisoned, but Sapphira replied that she hadn't even started yet. Ike noticed that he was poisoned and that the treatment wasn't helping, and it was done to ensure Jace wouldn't reveal information about them. In the end, Jace died without having the chance to tell who had given him this task. Later that evening, Ike and Sapphira went to the Demon Queen, and Sapphira revealed that the main traitor turned out to be Basteo, the commander of the Third Corps. The Queen asked if she could prove it. Sapphira replied that he had seduced her deputy and was planning to kill Ike and Sapphira, and then the Demon Lord. 
The queen said, really, and then remarked on how Sapphira perceived the information, asking how Ike saw it, looking at the skeleton holding its helmet and standing behind Ike and Sapphira. 